Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us at the MSU Science Festival. Today, I'm here with Maris Polanco, who's telling us about her plastic jellyfish. I'm really excited to hear what you have to say today, Maris. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Hi, I'm Maris Polanco. I'm a Detroit scientist, educator, and artist. I teach biology at the university level. Um, today, we're going to talk about the science behind a giant hanging sculpture that I made called Eternal. Eternal is a 60 foot long jellyfish made out of plastic bags. It was first on display at the Michigan Science Center in 2019 as part of Science Gallery Detroit. And it was then chosen to be part of the cultural program at the National Academy of Sciences in 2020. The National Academy of Sciences had a whole uh, program of events and talks centered around it in Washington, DC, but you know what happened in 2020. So most of those events never happened, but that's okay. Um, then the Smithsonian Early Enrichment Center approached me and we wrote a children's book and made a website about the sculpture and the science behind it. So I recorded myself reading it and you can find it in the videos link in my booth. The website also has um, a bunch of resources for adults and children also linked in my booth. But what is the sculpture all about? It's about plastic pollution. So let's talk about that. How much pollution is there and how is it interacting with our world? Most plastic waste that isn't buried in an inland landfill will end up in the oceans. Every year, this amounts to about 8 million tons of plastic. According to the National Geographic, of the 6,300 million tons, it's a mouthful, of plastic that have been produced in the past six decades, an estimated 9% has been recycled and about 12% has been incinerated. So the rest, which is the vast majority, still exists somewhere on the planet and much of it is in the ocean. This plastic can be found everywhere in the ocean, from the beaches to the Arctic to just floating in the middle of it, even down at the uh, bottom of the Mariana Trench, which is shown here. Plastic that doesn't sink or wash up to the shore gets caught in these giant oceanic vortexes called gyres. Each of these gyres is home to a floating smog of plastic and microplastics. The most famous is the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which is not exactly a patch, but like I said, a giant floating smog. Um, it's approximately 1 million square miles in the Northern Pacific Ocean. There's also the North Atlantic Garbage Patch, which is harder to measure because it moves north and south each season. Um, but the other gyres also have garbage patches. So in total, there are about 5 trillion pieces of plastic in the ocean. So let's look at another set of numbers, the lifespan of these plastic products that we use daily. Plastic was actually once hailed as a wonder material because it's so durable, but we will run into issues when this extremely durable material is incorporated into disposable products that we use for less than one day before throwing them away. So I figure you can read, but let's look at the numbers anyway. It takes 20 years for a plastic bag to break down. And that's actually a shorter estimate than what I've heard from some other sources. Slightly thicker plastic items take longer to break down, much longer. Plastic straws, six pack rings, plastic water bottles, plastic cups, they take hundreds of years to break down. One of the problems that arises as a result of plastic pollution is animal entanglement. This can happen with post-consumer plastic, like the plastic ring that deformed this turtle, or with discarded plastic fishing nets, which is such a problem that it's actually 46% of all large plastic found in the ocean. Oops, moving you over here. <laughs> Another problem is the accidental or purposeful ingestion of plastic by sea animals and seabirds. Accidental ingestion can happen when large filter feeding animals like whales um, just accidentally consume plastic that's floating among their food source. 
other animals purposefully consume plastic, probably because they're mistaking it for a food item. The end result is the same. Plastic doesn't break down, and thus it accumulates in their gastrointestinal tract, slowly filling them with plastic until they can no longer meaningfully consume food, and then they die of starvation, which is terrible. This image here um, really inspired me when I saw it in 2018, and it was really just floating around the internet as a meme. Um, but it made me think. So jellyfish evolved 500 million years ago. Sea turtles evolved 230 million years ago. Um, and for that matter, other animals affected by this issue. Birds evolved 65 million years ago. Whales evolved 100, oh, sorry. Whales evolved 8 million years ago. But plastic was invented less than 100 years ago. So none of these animals are evolutionarily equipped to tell the difference between plastic and their usual lineup of recognizable food items. But plastic is now everywhere in their environment and fatal if ingested. There are probably even some whales and sea turtles that are older than the invention of plastic itself and are now eating plastic. And I understand that some people don't care about saving the whales, which is crazy to me, but that's reality. But the thing is, large marine animals like whales don't only live in the ocean, but they're part of the ocean's functioning as we know it. The world ocean, not just as a body of water, but as a productive ecosystem, provides resources that are necessary for us to live, like oxygen. 50% of the oxygen in the air is produced by the phytoplankton that live in the ocean. And about a third of the carbon dioxide that is, rec or, uh, is it reabsorbed into the water from the atmosphere is reabsorbed by those phytoplankton. The ocean and the atmosphere are interlinked because of these tiny organisms that exist in enormous numbers. And how is this relevant? Well, the phytoplankton owe their current success to large animals that provide them with nutrients. The middle of the ocean, which is also known as the high seas or the pelagic zone, is actually basically a desert. It's just salt water and sunlight with almost no nutrients. But this is where the phytoplankton live. Because they can photosynthesize, they get their energy from the sun and they get their carbon from carbon dioxide from the air but they still need elements like nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus, all those things that we see in fertilizers that we would buy from the store. So they get this from giant fecal plumes of whales and other animals that swim through this area. Whales and other large sea animals feed at the bottom of the ocean or near the shores, but they poop up near the surface where the phytoplankton are living. This cycles nutrients generally from the deep sea up to the pelagic zone. We refer to this as the whale pump. And it is such a strong force of nature that has changed the way the oceans function to support more phytoplankton at their current levels. One more thing about phytoplankton, um, they're also the basis of the marine food chain. So much like plants at the bottom of the food chain on land, Photosynthetic organisms like phytoplankton, seagrass, algae, or whatever, they are the bottom of the food chain of the ocean. Phytoplankton are consumed by zooplankton, which are then consumed by small fish, etc., until eventually they're consumed by large fish, the intermediate predators, and at the very top, they're consumed by the top predators. I really like this graph actually because it provides a, uh, a weight comparison. So you can see here that for every one pound of tuna that the ocean can produce, it required 1,000 pounds of phytoplankton to feed everything that that thing had eaten along the way. So, no, oh, where was I? The phytoplankton themselves, sorry, the phytoplankton themselves rely on the whale pump to maintain their current um, numbers. And now the whales, who already have a reduced population due to whaling of the 18th century, are having their population further reduced from eating plastic of the 19th and 20th century. 
So let's look back at this image because of course it gets worse. Um, the number of years listed is how long it takes for this plastic to break down. And that's how long this item of plastic is a threat to animals, correct? Not exactly. So what do we really mean by breakdown? When we talk about wood or paper or cardboard, we mean it gets decomposed into smaller carbohydrate molecules, which then can feed bacteria and fungi, and that's all natural order of things. Um, glass and concrete break down into sand, approximately. Um, iron rusts into powder. But plastic actually just breaks down into microplastic, um, which is arguably more dangerous than the original plastic product because now it gets eaten by animals at the bottom of the food chain. The zooplankton, baby fish, macroinvertebrates, krill, basically all the little guys who become food for everyone else. So what is happening to the whales, dolphins, sea turtles, large fish, and seabirds on the large scale is also happening to baby fish, zooplankton, shrimp, clams, and even coral on a small scale. Microplastics often become coated in bacteria that masks their smell, so they're indistinguishable from food particles. They also absorb toxins and then re-release them into the bodies of the animals that eat them. These photos here show a young fish that has died from ingesting microplastics, a small crustacean that has microplastics in its body, um, coral that were discovered to be preferentially eating microplastic beads, like from shampoo, instead of actual food. Um, and even if ingesting the microplastic pieces doesn't kill them outright, it causes them to become malnourished, slowing down their growth, um, declining their population levels, or making them slower to mature into adults to re replace the population that is being either fished or hunted, or also decimated by plastic. It has been discovered that there's more plastic in the ocean than young fish, which is a very, very chilling statistic. The last part of this process is called bioaccumulation. When small fish who have eaten plastic get eaten by larger fish, the plastic from the small fish accumulates in the larger fish. So even without eating plastic, they're still eating plastic. Toxic chemicals from the plastic leach out of their digestive tract and into their body tissues. When they get eaten by something else, plastic from their digestive tract and chemicals from their body are transferred to the larger predator. This accumulates as you go up the food chain. So the largest predators have the most microplastic and toxins in their body. And those predators include us humans if we are eating seafood. So if you eat large fish from the top of the food chain, like tuna, you're actually getting exposed to all of the plastic and plastic-borne chemicals from everything that that fish has ever eaten and everything that its prey has ever eaten. Some of these chemicals include hormone disruptors and carcinogens. This is one of the many reasons that it's actually healthier to eat small fish that, they, that have experienced less bioaccumulation. Also, they have like more omegas, omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acid. Some examples include sardines, herring, and mackerel. So we, uh, my household, have actually fished, or have actually switched entirely to small fish for this reason. And I have to say that they're so much more flavorful that now when I eat tuna or salmon, it's kind of like, eh, it's bland in comparison. Another reason to do this is that fishing top predators, like the biggest fish in the ocean, is a huge strain on the ecosystem. It's much easier for small fish populations to regenerate because there's just naturally more of them in the ocean. That's how the food chain works. There's more of the small things. So it's a more sustainable choice. The next part of this talk is why recycling is broken. So yes, plastic is terrible and it's killing us all. Um, what do we do about it? I would love to say that recycling is the answer, but recycling as we know it, as it's been advertised and sold to us, is mostly a lie, which is terrible. 
recycling is a great idea and it needs to happen more and we actually definitely need legislation and regulations to make recycling more common and more efficient. Um, but currently, most recyclable plastics that are like submitted to recycling are actually just redesignated and recategorized as trash. So you can see here, um, of plastic cups that were submitted for recycling, 11% were accepted, <clears throat> almost 90% were not. Plastic bags, plastic plates, and plastic cutlery, even higher rates of just getting recategorized as trash. The trash, plastic trash, then enters the plastic cycle, as I call it, which isn't really a cycle, but it's, okay, anyway. So for time reasons, I'll be brief on this subject. Um, if you're interested in the economic health and social issues surrounding the waste trade, I recommend the documentary, The Plastic Problem, which I have linked in my booth. It is very, very important information, also very depressing. Um, so I'm just alluding to some of the things that they talked about in this documentary. Basically, before China stopped accepting our plastic trash in 2018, it was mostly sent there for people to sort through at extremely low wages. This created a whole economy of rubbish pickers who made a meager living sorting through the Western world's plastic trash. Then they banned taking our trash. So we started sending our trash to South Asian countries like Malaysia, Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia, and the Philippines, which isn't any better. We're still just sending trash to people on the other side of the world. Then they imposed stricter regulations. So currently the US sends the trash to Cambodia, Bangladesh, Ghana, Laos, Ethiopia, Kenya, and Senegal. So that's where a lot of the trash is going, even if you think it's being recycled. Aside from being a humanitarian insult, this is actually how a lot of that plastic ends up in the ocean. Open air trash heaps are not self-contained, so they can be disturbed by weather and water. Additionally, they leach chemicals into the soil and the water, and the common practice of burning the plastic pollutes the air. Plastic trash from the first world countries, instead of being recycled, pile up and directly harm people on the other side of the world. The incidence of respiratory illness, hormonal disturbance, and cancer are way higher in areas that have these giant plastic piles. So why is all this recyclable plastic being sent overseas? Because it was actually not really going to be recycled in the first place. So despite the huge potential for recycling to increase sustainability, decrease pollution, provide a whole sector of jobs, the infrastructure actually isn't there. Almost all of the hype around recycling, starting in the 70s, was pushed by oil and plastic companies in an attempt to greenwash their image. They predicted, very correctly, that consumers would be more likely to accept plastic packaging if they believed it could be recycled. So the companies who pushed this image have profited immensely from this. Um, it's much cheaper to just make new plastic and then pro or then to process and recycle used plastic, but all the while maintaining a green image by making your product recyclable, quote, quote. So this is not to say that recycling isn't worth it, but it is to say that the current recycling system is broken. Um, because as I said at the very beginning of this, less than 10% of plastic has ever been recycled. Oh, hi. Okay, so what can we do about this? Plastic is everywhere. Recycling is not what we, it claims to be. Um, there's a looming plastic crisis. Um, it is hard to know exactly what to do. So I'll talk about what I did because this is my webinar, of course. Um, but then I'll talk about some of the things you can do. Um, there are also lots of things that um, activism groups and uh, forward thinkers are doing that I don't even have time to cover. But there are some links, and there are even more if you just search for it on the internet. Okay, moving on. So I built Eternal, this giant plastic jellyfish made out of uh, shopping bags, as a way to make a statement. 
And I wasn't only trying to just like raise awareness, quote unquote. I was actually trying to make enough noise in a public enough space that either qualified scientists would collaborate with me or communicators with a platform would give me a stage. That's why I made it over 60 feet long, suspended from the ceiling, to be a big piece of art about a big problem that is literally hanging over us, so artistically and figuratively. When it went up at the National Academy of Science and had this whole host of events pl planned around it, it's when I knew that it had a shot at not only educating, but inspiring people to act. Even though most of its programming was canceled due to COVID, um, I saw from its two events that if you get people excited and inspired by something um, and then show them that they actually can make somewhat of a difference, you can empower them to act. So I will not claim to be an expert on plastic remediation processes, um, but these are just some of the things that um, have kind of like a low entry fee, if you will, a easy thing to do that does actually help. Um, anything you can do to prevent plastic from entering the ocean is significant. With the current state of how recycling is, until better regulations and infrastructure is uh, created, it's actually best to just obviously first reduce your intake, but then also repurpose your plastic waste instead of uh, sending it to trash or recycling, which are almost the same thing. One really cool thing you can do with your plastic bags, if you have a bunch of them, is turn them into Plarn, spelled P-L-A-R-N, um, also known as plastic yarn, and then you can make basically anything out of them that you would make from yarn. So I've provided a website in my resources about this, um, but there's like infinite websites about how to do this. Um, it's a skill, like learning to crochet or knit is somewhat of a skill, but you know, we all could use a new hobby. Every bag that you turn into a rug or basket or bracelet is not only not getting inside a sea creature and not getting sifted through by people on the opposite side of the world that didn't ask for our trash, um, but if you, you know, if it's like not your vibe to have a rug made out of plarn, you can sell it on the internet because there are people who love that stuff. Um, and this is an actually a green product and it can make you some extra cash. It's a win-win. If you don't like crochet, you can also recycle HDPE, which is high density polyethylene, the colorful hard plastic, into various useful items. Um, it can be melted down into like, you know, reshaping the plastic into things like coasters or pens. Um, plastic bottles can be cut into strips and then woven kind of like grass into, you know, things like bins or trash, trash cans, yes. Um, and then um, the internet is like positively flooded with adorable art projects that you can do with recyclable stuff. So I really liked this one kitty planters made out of plastic bottles. So precious. Okay, on the construction side of things, um, styrofoam and actually plastic bags can be incorporated into cement. There's specific ways to do this. Um, I wouldn't say just try it on your own because you might end up with failed bricks. Um, so there's one tutorial, but you can also find more on the internet. Um, the one that I included, they have tested out these bricks um, and they found that they are lighter than normal bricks, obviously, because there's styrofoam in them, but they can be used for structure or insulation and they are not flammable. So that is key. Um, if you're thinking about building a greenhouse, uh, you can build it out of plastic bottles. These are just examples, but Basically, if your goal is to reduce the amount of plastic you throw away, there's a wealth of resources online. And if you're really passionate about it and or you just need more materials, start a group or collective of your friends to pool resources. When I made the giant jellyfish, I had to get bags from like 15 other households. And I'll have to do it again when I'm building more jellyfish for MSU in a more permanent installation. Another thing you can do is support and advocate for plastic alternatives. 
you can petition companies to transition to paper packaging or um, easier is just support and buy the products of small businesses that use sustainable packaging because it's actually not often the cheapest option. So if they're using sustainable packaging, you know, we should support them in that. Another thing you can do is write to your representative about pollution. So I found a really cool um, template for writing to your elected official about plastic in the Great Lakes. And I've included this in the resources tab. You can also, oh, whoops. You can also sign petitions and join social media campaigns urging companies to discontinue their use of plastic bags or other single use plastic. A quick online search will lead you to a bunch of petitions targeted at Walmart, Amazon, and top plastic polluters like Coca-Cola and Nestle. Um, petitions don't always lead to change, but studies have shown that petitions are the most likely to work when they are targeted at a specific company and receive significant press. So if you see one that is receiving press, adding your name to it might help. More directly, you can actually just join or donate to groups who do activism and plastic cleanup. Donating is a great option for people who don't have very much time but have a comfortable amount of money. Or joining the groups or participating in the cleanups is really good for people who do have time and a desire to build community. Most, if not all of these groups are nonprofit and depend on funding by partners and donors. And in terms of making a difference, our efforts are much more fruitful when we work together. So these organizations pictured here are just a few of many, many, many organizations that are participating in ocean cleanup, river cleanup, plastic cleanup, lobbying against uh, plastic polluters, and lobbying for plastic regulations. Finally, you can vote. Um, Vote for candidates that enact sustainability and environmental policies that you agree with. And this is not just the presidential election, but at every level. Vote at every level that you can, the state level, county level, city level, school board elections, uh, university president, provost, whatever. Um, vote for the presiding judges in your county. Do your research and, research and see who believes what. Uh, basically for any elected position, you can have a say in which person is there making those lasting decisions. Um, and this is especially important in a country that is as big as ours because we're very divided and gridlocked. So local regulations are often the first thing to change instead of uh, federal regu regulations. It's usually at the local level that things change first. So thank you for attending my webinar. Um, let me know if you have any questions or want to have more in-depth conversations about any of these topics. If you're interested in following me on social media, my handles are here. It's just my name. Um, the Twitter is mostly science and the Instagram is mostly art and music. If you are local, keep an eye on Lyman Briggs College because I'm putting up some jellyfish there in the relatively near future. And finally, I'd like to thank MSU for this opportunity to give this presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so much, Maris. That was really informative. I see a question in the Q&A. They're asking, how does plastic impact the Great Lakes? I see. Oh, whoops. Um, well, there's plastic pollution in, you know, basically every body of water. So plastic that ends up in the Great Lakes will either sink to the bottom of the Great Lakes or float within it and affect the uh, animals and, you know, microorganism bodies that live there. Or, you know, the Great Lakes do eventually end up uh, flowing out into the ocean. So any plastic that does not get caught in the Great Lakes system itself will flow out to the ocean up near Nova Scotia. I don't know. Yes, up near Nova Scotia, I believe. That's okay. Um, I saw someone raise their hand for a second. You, uh, then, okay, someone uh, wrote in the chat, where are you from? 
can you put info on where you are exhibiting? Yes, here, wait, let me just reshare. Okay, so I am from Michigan. Um, I went to MSU. Um, I currently, li currently live in Detroit and teach at the college level in Detroit and Dearborn. Although teaching from home right now, I'm just teaching everything from this room. Uh, what was the second part of that question? Where are you exhibiting? Where am I exhibiting? Um, new jellyfish are going up at Lyman Briggs College, um, if all goes according to plan, this fall. So that's at MSU in Holmes Hall, which is on the east side of campus. It's like the, uh, the residential science college of which I'm an alumnus. So it's pretty cool that I'm putting some art there. Yeah, I personally have a question. Um, you all are still welcome to keep writing them in the chat or in the Q&A. But I was wondering, why don't we clean up those big mounds in the ocean? And if we were to clean it up or gather all that, what would we do with it? Would we just melt it down? Um, so people are trying to clean them up. There's like the ocean cleanup. And there's a couple uh, projects where they basically go out there with like huge fine nets and they try and like gather all the plastic and microplastic that they can. Um, so that's that's really good. And I would like to like support them in that. Um, I plan on like donating to them and then maybe when lockdown is over, see if I can actually get involved. <clears throat> in terms of what to do with the plastic after that, because yeah, when you throw it away, how do you know it won't end up back in the ocean? Um, there have been uh, some pilots on incineration of plastic but like controlled incineration with really good filters to make sure that you aren't just like spitting out terrible toxic fumes um and i'm not an expert on this but like in my like with my level of like scientific mind is like to me that seems like a good idea so there are i think it's like the u.s navy this is in uh the documentary the plastic problem uh, so you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's the U.S. Navy that on their ships, they have a very highly advanced incinerator that incinerates all of their plastic just down into carbon um, so that they don't have any waste from their ship because, you know, they're like a self-contained unit. Um, and if that can be uh, implemented on a large scale, or at least for the stuff that's being pulled out of the ocean, so you can just like get rid of it once and for all, theoretically, it has potential because once it's ash, it's not plastic anymore. That's all I got on that. <laughs> well, that was great. Thank you so much, Maris. Um, really enjoyed hearing your talk. It was very informative and I can't wait to tell my friends about it, honestly. Um, you could post this recording on your booth and everything so other people can enjoy it as well. And thank you to our attendees. I hope to see you at future talks for the rest of the day and for the rest of the month too. Okay, thank you. I'll see you later.